This is Duke University. This week on Office Hours, Duke professor Kathy Rudy is concerned about the welfare of animals, but she says that doesn't mean she has to be a vegetarian. In her new book, Loving Animals, Rudy offers an alternative to what she calls the extremist positions of the contemporary animal rights movements. She has also taught courses on the politics of food and is currently working on an ethnography of local farmers. Rudy takes your questions on animals in love, food, and sustainability. I'm Camille Jackson with the Duke News Office, and today we are talking with Kathy Rudy, Women's Studies Professor, about food and animals and love and sustainability. Kathy, welcome. Thanks, Camille. I'm very happy to be here. Now, you're a women's studies professor. <clears throat> Tell me about the connection between feminism and animals. Sure. Um, you know, feminism is not and never has been just about gender equality. It's really been about building a better world for everybody in visions of a you know, social atmosphere that allows every living thing to flourish. And back in the 70s and 80s, one of feminism's major agenda items was really nature and animals. And in the last couple decades, we've sort of drifted, and many of us have drifted and worked on other things. And I think that uh, some of us are really moving back to these questions in light of you know, global uh, environmental devastation, species loss, et cetera. Um, so, so how is this a feminism issue? Well, because the goal of feminism is to think about how we reproduce daily life for all beings um, in ways that are beneficial, mutually beneficial. Fem feminism is really about kind of a global justice. Um, it's not just about women. It never has been. That's sort of a caricature. It's mm -hmm. really kind of a social vision. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're used to a kind of feminism that's pretty narrow sometimes, and we need to expand that and be able to use feminist theory and feminist insights to talk about ecology, environmentalism, and animals. Well, speaking of narrow, in your book, Loving Animals, um, you uh, talk about a philosophical shift in animal advocacy. Right. Tell me about that. So that's something very much associated with feminism. And, um, you know, the dominant philosophical model that runs most of our lives comes from analytical philosophy tradition in the form of liberalism. And that's, you know, um, executed by the uh, work of rights. So we live in this world where we have um, these things called human rights. And rights are really ways of protecting ourselves from each other and from the state and close sealing off a, a, a space for every individual human being um, that's protected, right? And um, feminism is at the forefront of thinking about the limitations of that model and what animal, ad what animal rights wants to do is take that model that's really designed only for humans um, and move it to the world of animals. Use or move it to the world of some animals. Using feminist theory, I'm suggesting that we drift away from analytical philosophy, not that rights and public policy um, and the law should be abandoned, but that we need a more expansive um, view to build a more viable social movement. And to do that, I turn to continental philosophy and to Eastern religious thought to build a theory that's based not on a protected sphere where we are... Ad, or we are um, adversaries, but rather to build a social theory um, grounded on connection, grounded on the fact that the, um, the stuff that separates me from the rest of the world is very porous, and therefore it's in my interest, it's in all of our interest to care for the world because the world is part of us. Mm -hmm. We are inside it. The food we eat, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the soil that grows our food, they all become a part of us. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking for, and feminism at large is looking for theories um, or some versions of feminism 
is looking for theories that highlight that enmeshment and interconnectedness and f and help us figure out how to have justice within that. Mm -hmm. So f in terms of animals then, I move away from that rights model, that animal rights model where we're extending human rights into the world of animals and instead flipping the whole thing around and thinking about how we are not how we need not to be protected from each other, but engaged with each other, responsible to each other, loving each other. And connected. And connected. So last year, the program in women's studies dedicated a year to uh, the question of the animal. That's right. And you uh, helped organize to bring Temple Grandin here. That's correct. And she talked about her connection with animals. Absolutely, yes. Yes, it was a very exciting event for us and... Um, really helped us think about how humans and animals can be, uh, can and ought to be more interconnected. You know, she's a high functioning person, or she's a person with high functioning autism. And um, I think her connection is really special. Mm -hmm. She sort of, you know, has an emotional framework that um, allows her to understand the world of animals maybe even better than us neurotypicals. Yes, and I think we have a, a, a clip of her talking oh, great. about that. Now, doesn't an animal actually have emotions? You know, some people think that's real controversial. Well, there's a lot of similarities about the nervous system. Prozac works on dogs. There's scientific papers on that. The neurotransmitters are the same. Now, there's some differences. We have a bigger cortex. It gets a lot more complicated. But yeah, basic emotions and Jank Panskip, one of the first neuroscientists to sort of you know, catalog out the basic emotions of fear, anger, okay. separation anxiety, or what he calls panic. But there's also the emotion to seek out and look at new things. You know, and some animals are really high seekers and others are not. You got some of these like lanky, frisky labs, they want to just go out there and just look at, and exit, look at everything. Then you got the heavy set, quiet labs. Well, they're content to lay around all day. You see the sort of differences. You can have an animal that's a high seeker or a low seeker, or a high fear or a low fear. And you can actually breed them separately. These, are, can, these traits can be uh, genetically separated. And she's pretty clear in that about how we communicate signal to animals. Yes, absolutely. And her work on emotion in what I call in this book affect is really important. Um, one of the central arguments I'm making is that animal advocacy is far behind other social movements. When you think about the second half of the 20th century, you think free speech, uh, civil rights, women's movement, gay and lesbian li liberation, um, you know, immigrant rights, all kinds of things. Many of those, not all, and they're not complete revolutions, and I'm not saying everything's perfect, but many of those, um, social movements have received a kind of acceptance in the wider culture. It's no longer weird to be gay, right? It's sort of okay. It's no longer weird to be a woman who wants a profession. It's sort of socially accepted. My argument is that all of those, so the, all of those initiatives understood that social change was not only about laws and rights, but shifts in people's hearts, shifts in the way the larger population saw the world, um, and an appeal to a kind of emotional transformation that, um, that allowed for wider acceptance. That has not happened, I, I argue, in animal advocacy, because the movement has been completely contained or managed by that rights discourse. Now there's, I mean, I, I'm, you know, stepping on a lot of toes because there is animal welfare and animal pr protection, and yes, those are important pieces, but they are often overshadowed by the discourse of rights, which argues the only way to do this is to extend the catalog of human rights into the realm of some animals. And that, that agenda kind of squeezes out 
um, a lot of people in the general public from participating in animal advocacy. Now, you've written a lot about ethics. Yes. And so would that be the platform then that you're rejecting? Yes. As opposed to the one that you're promoting in, in your book. What? Tell me more about what, what you are promoting in your book, what animal advocacy, contemporary animal advocacy should look like. Okay. I'm arguing that, um, that we need advocacy based on affect. And what I mean by that is that we need to start with emotional connections and stories about those emotions. Now, by this, I do not mean a sentimentalized version of Disney. I'm talking about a, um, a affective approach that almost borders on the spiritual that we need to see ourselves in the other and see our lives as dependent on the other's flourishing. And how I execute that in this book, a lot of animal advocacy stuff starts with animals in the wild and moves down. And the closer you get to domesticity, the more um, problematic it gets. And animals in the wild are the ones that are, have the real value. This book flips that around and says um, that if we begin our social movement and begin our affective shift, our world shift, with the animals that are closest to our heart, it's an easy thing then to, or it can be a very easy thing to move out. So in America today, um, over 75% of homes have pets. And in most, I'm not arguing that all pet owners are good, et cetera, mm -hmm. but in most of those homes, the pets are part of the family. The pets are seen as, you know, um, inter integral emotional beings in the, life of, in the life of the family. And mm -hmm. as we get more and more mobile, move farther and farther away from extended family, pets are even more and more important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We start there. We start our social movement there and say, okay, Miles, a yeah. dog, for example, uh -huh. um, um, I really love you and there isn't anything I wouldn't do for you. So uh -huh. let me think about how I feel then about other animals, animals used for food or clothing mm. or entertainment or scientific research. Mm -hmm. You if you could speak, Miles, you would say, um, here's how they should be treated. And I need to start thinking in the frame of extending my love for you out to other people. Right. This does right. not mean we don't need laws. It does not mean we don't need, right. you know, protections. But it's going to change the way the public thinks about things. So th this, this is, this is, I'm glad you're saying this because Miles is my dog. I know. And, <laughs> and so um, looking at the connection I have with Miles, um, are you then saying we should, we as owners, pet owners, should take that connection and apply it to the food that we eat? Absolutely. And the, and the animals that are raised on farms yes. and the kind of lives they have yes. and what they want. And the dogs in the shelter that yeah. don't have a break and the dogs mm. in, you know, puppy mills that are designed to lead terrible lives mm -hmm. and um, not designed to lead terrible lives, but are, are bred irresponsibly and sent out over the internet and often are really damaged and make very bad pets. And that whole pet industry thing is, is very problematic. And that connection is hard to explain to people who don't have that, um, right. who don't know it. Why do you think we as society have become so disconnected from our food, the source of our food, um, and even from domesticated uh, Animals. Well, I don't think we have become disconnected from pets. Mm. See, that's the thing. We're more connected than ever. Mm -hmm. We've become disconnected from our food as a direct result of corporate takeover of the food supply. Mm -hmm. We have no idea where our meat comes from, no idea where our plants and fruits and vegetables come from. And, I mean, that's a, a really, really long story that has to do with World War II and chemicals and you know, corporate conglomerates right. and um, all kinds of things. I don't think we want to get into all that here, but... Well, when uh, Jonathan Saffron Four came mm -hmm. uh, last month to talk about his book, Eating Animals, um, he spoke about how we um, tend to think of farms as being these beautiful pastoral places. Right. Um, and I think we um, have a clip of him talking about that. And if you're eating meat that's sold in a supermarket, and you're eating meat from a restaurant, 
if you are not actively seeking out these alternatives, maybe at a green market or through a CSA, then you can feel very confident that you're eating this factory farm meat. So one of the reasons why we allow this to happen, despite the fact that we agree we don't want it, is because we're being fooled. Think about the labels in the supermarket on meat and on eggs. Um, they are of windowless sheds. Excuse me. They are never of windowless sheds. They are of pasture and animals on grass and farmers and sunshine, the kinds of things that we um, respect and respond to. You know, when we think about farming, that's what we think about. If I were to say, give me 10 words that you think about when you think about animal farming, I think most people would say grass, sunshine, hay, stuff like that. And these things have nothing to do with most farming anymore. But we're being manipulated by language and we're being manipulated by pictures. And what do you agree with him? 100%. I know you 110%. said I know you said he he shifted his views a little bit from when he wrote his book. Well, not on that not count. On that. I mean, he's he's been consistent there and he's right there. And anyone working on food or anyone working on um, animal agriculture is, uh, this is just completely transparent that mm -hmm. Um, what's happening in CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations, which, by the way... What do you call them? C CAFOs. CAFOs. Uh -huh, that's the word the okay. industry uses. Oh. Um, and by the way, North Carolina is second um, in CAFO-produced pork, second in the nation. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is a major thing in our state, um, mm -hmm. this this hog, hog production. Any, t any road you take to the beach, you see these windowless sheds, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, Smithfield. And sometimes right? you yeah. can smell it. Yeah, sometimes yeah. you can smell it. Right? <laughs> and so, um, but the good news is that people are waking up. It's, um, you know, I mark it kind of with the publication of Michael Pollan's Omnivore's Dilemma. Mm -hmm. Farmers markets were starting a little bit before that, but they've really taken off Um since that book and many, many hundreds and hundreds of others. And so the good news is people are kind of waking up to the fact that this this supermarket meat is really tainted. And so what in in if you had your ideal world, what would life what is a good enough life for a farm animal? What would that look like? Um well I would say I mean a, a life at least um double what it is to get to market weight. So if it takes two years for a pig to get to market weight, probably needs to be able to live on this earth four or five. Now, wild hogs can maybe live 15, but where are they gonna live anymore? Mm -hmm. They're incredible, you know, so these are, these are negotiations we're having that it, ideally we would want them to live a full and natural life before we eat them. Economic factors press in on that, so we have to make some compromises. But, you know, a couple of years for chickens, four or five years for hogs, five or six for cows, um, you know, as long a life as possible on pasture, with some shelter, in the sun, having mates, having children, having really food designed for what you know for them not not corn and soy which is what fed, what is fed to our grocery store mm -hmm. farm animals mm -hmm. um but grass the vast majority of many of these animals are ruminants and really need grass and putting them on pasture solves so many problems it just takes more room and costs more money right um and so you know drug free Unless, unless there's an illness. I mean, this is the thing that, mm. um, you know, we give prophylactic antibiotics to our uh, factory farmed uh, mammals mm -hmm. so that because the conditions are so crowded and so polluted mm -hmm. that all of them will get sick almost immediately unless we give them antibiotics to prevent illness. And then we end up eating that when we... And, eat absolutely. Right. And... Um, uh, the seventy percent of antibiotic pharmaceutical antibiotics in the United States goes to animals. Thirty percent goes to humans, and the seventy percent that are fed to animals 
are also creating these super bugs like swine flu, bird ah. flu. And most people, Jonathan Saffron before is one of the first ones to make this claim, but a lot of people have followed suit that um, even MRSA comes from from uh, animal farming, intensive animal farming. Well, we have some questions here from viewers, and one of the questions okay. kind of relates to something you said a okay. second ago. Uh, this question uh, came via email from Jack. You say it's okay for people to eat meat if they know where it comes from. You encourage them to meet the farmers who raise the animals. That may, that may work fine in a place like Durham, but is it realistic for someone living in New York or another big city? You know, the interesting thing about this local food movement is that, um, is that um, big cities are at the forefront. And so New York City has something like 41 farmer's markets, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Kind of unbelievable. And um, in, the, in, in, in most of those cases, there are farm tours at least once a year that you sign up for. You get on a bus and you go actually visit the farm. If that's not really possible because it's too far away and you don't have the time, you talk to the farmer. You look at pictures of their farm. Go to the, mm. I mean, any farmer's market, you just go and ask and say, can I see what your farm looks like? And this is what you do when you go. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, you know, these you go on one of these farm tours. I know it sounds like, oh, God, like, you know, what am I, I'm just going to, like, step in a lot of manure. But it's really <laughs> not like that. It's a lot of fun. And you get to really see um, differences in the way they're growing animals. And you get to pick who, who do I want to be responsible mm -hmm. for the relationship um, I have with the animal that produces my cheese, my eggs, or my meat. Well, we have another question that came via email from okay. Ron. He says, uh, you accept the idea of using animals to test new drugs and medical devices. How about using them to test things that are less essential to human life, like cosmetics? Is that morally acceptable to you? Okay, this is really complicated, and I'll try my best to give the short answer. I do not endorse animal testing for cosmetics in any way, shape, or form. I also don't, re I kind of dance around the answer in the book. Mm. I don't That's really, yeah. Yeah, 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 I don't really endorse um, using animals for testing medicines. Um, and it, and I, got, I mean, like I say, this is so complicated. First of all, a lot of the animals we're using are um, being tested on medicines that we already have on the market or we have versions of on the market, but the patent's running out. That's totally wrong. Um, moreover, what I argue in the book, and this is going to be, it's going to be hard to put into a sound bite, but, um, <laughs> but if we're going to do that, we need to know their character. And that sounds ridiculous, but animals have character, and they are able to communicate that character. And before we take them and do invasive surgery or, you know, horrible things to them, we need to know that they would, would be the kind of character that would want to be a hero. Well, I've got several dogs that would love to be a hero, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I've got others who just, you know, if something was attacking me, they'd run the other way, <laughs> right? right? right. And, you know, we've just got to enter into relationship with them if we're going to use them for anything. And we've got to listen and we've got to have public discussions about how to sort this stuff out. Um, Is that what you mean when you talk about the, the spirituality of animals? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We're going to get it wrong. Mm -hmm. They don't use human words. Mm -hmm. um, but right now we have nothing. We have no discussion. Right. And that we need to be able, it's some, some of it's not like, you know, woo-woo. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's looking at how they act. If they're biting themselves or spinning or peeing where they're not supposed to mm -hmm. or, you know, doing, um, uh, 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 aggressing on animals that are bigger than, uh, than them and acting not normally, um, we have to sort of step back and say something's wrong here. Um, and most people, I'm not an ethologist and I'm not an animal behaviorist, but most people 
can sort of tell when an animal is really, really unhappy and when it's not. Mm -hmm. And my argument is, for science, back to that question, that we've got to figure out how to do this in a way that's as loving and connected as possible for them. Mm -hmm. There are some people who would say, if I could be uh, assistance, of assistance in finding a cure for cancer, I would like that. Experiment on me. Mm -hmm. I would like to the rest of humanity to be um, in a better world because of me. And there are many people who say, no way, Jose, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the same is true for animals. And partly what we need to do then is knock down or, or, or challenge the wall between science and the public so that we can have these conversations with scientists. More animals are being used in scientific research than ever before, and we don't know what they're being used for. Mm -hmm. And scientists are extremely defensive, rightly so, because there are factions of the animal rights movement that are very aggressive and violent. Yes. And so scientists are closed up. They don't want to say anything because right, right. they're afraid their lab is going to be bombed. Right. And I get that. That's why... We've got to sort of stop having this conversation from positions of defensiveness and protecting and violence and instead have these conversations in pursuit of love, connection, generosity, mm-hmm. and mutuality. And that's what you're asking for in your book. Absolutely. Um, you're asking for um, um, a more moderate type of viewpoint on veganism and vegetarianism. Correct. And you say something interesting. You say vegetarians are not that different from meat eaters. Well, and from the perspective of animal welfare. From the I perspective mean, of animal you welfare. You know, the, um, uh, vegetarians aren't, do not benefit from active killing, and that is a difference. But if you look at the system, if you're eating dairy and eggs, you are in a, a, a world where animals need to be reproduced, and half the animals that are reproduced are going to be males, and those guys are going to have to be killed. And whether it's veal for cows or, you know, male chicks just go into the dumpster Mm -hmm. um, or raised up as roosters but killed before they can be aggressive, um, you're in a system of killing. Now, I don't think that's bad. I'm not a vegan. I don't think that's bad. Because here's my argument. The central argument of this cha- of the food chapter in this book is that every living thing on this planet is food for something else. And we have to wake up to that fact and start um, more green burials. You know, the way we bury ourselves now in vaults and steel, ca- you know, steel caskets, ah. we want... We don't the want the worms and bugs to, and, and yeah. microbes to ever get us. Right. Well, you know, I'll tell you what, they're gonna. <laughs> yeah. And until we can start seeing everything on the planet as part of an integrated food system, mm-hmm. um, we are going to end up in a world where humans think they're better than it all yeah. and can use everything in the background as they want. That's what's happening with ecological devastation today. We are losing Mm -hmm. our planet Mm -hmm. because we think we have the right, we have the superiority to have all of nature be at our use, be for our use. That has to shift. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, we actually have 100 people watching right now. And oh, that's yeah, great. Yeah, that's great. I, I would like to invite all of you to email a question for Kathy to live at duke.edu, or you can tweet your question on Twitter using the hashtag DukeLive. So we have a comment here from Ingrid, um, and this went back to something uh, you said earlier about farm tours. She says, I went on a farm tour here in North Carolina and had a great time. It was amazing to actually see where my veggies come from. I kicked myself for buying food in the past without even thinking if it was in season or locally grown. It takes some extra planning uh, for the menu, but it's worth that extra time. Y- yep. You, you totally. obviously agree with totally. that. And, and so thinking about um, other times when we've worked together before um, in advance of Thanksgiving, people are always talking about right. eating locally, going to the farmer's market. Right. And so you've seen an increase in... Oh, gosh. Um, absolutely. It's almost to the point here in Durham where the farmer's market 
becomes inconvenient because it's so crowded. Mm -hmm. um, and that's great. Yeah. I mean, I hope I wish they'd open up more hours, yeah. but yeah. you know. <laughs> um, um, I want to pick up on one thing that that uh, poster said, and uh -huh. that is that it takes a little planning. I'm totally down with this local thing and think it's the right thing. It's Im critically important, though, that the um, bulk of the labor of planning and finding and cooking and learning how to cook, all this great food does not fall back on women. Uh -huh. And, you know, there's a lot of parts of the locavore discourse that kind of make it seem like we should be returning to the small family farm of the 1950s. And, well, I'm all for supporting the small family farm. I don't want the ones that came out in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, we have made a lot of progress for women to move out of the kitchen and into the public sphere and into professions. And we can't slide backward on that. So it's critical in this new food activism, locavore movement, that um, we find ways of supporting each other in some in into in, in moving forward in a feminist world, not backward. And so some of that means men learning how to cook, and, and a lot are. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the gender stuff at the farmer's market is really pretty amazing, um, amazingly equal. So that's cool. But also community supported things. I know of a um, of a local food share in um, a neighborhood near me where, and I just think this is brilliant, where um, once a week seven people cook one thing, seven shares, and they all meet on Sunday afternoon, mm -hmm. freeze it, and all meet on Sunday afternoon and swap them. So every oh, person helpful. in that family, yeah. I mean, every family in that system, in those seven families... Get to turn. It, well, no, they all get a fresh local meal, mm -hmm. a different one, mm -hmm. every night of the week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can freeze them and bank them and that whole thing. And, and, um, and then we're not just cooking for these isolated nuclear families were cooking for our community. For the community. And I wish that Duke would get involved in helping to organize that stuff, putting yeah. up, you know, yeah. um, neighborhood uh, 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 systems of sign-up. Uh -huh. Along with that, and I'll get off my soapbox, yeah. I can tell I'm going on, yeah. but <laughs> the only thing that's critically important is getting all these great local foods into poor neighborhoods. There oh, are yes, talk places, about that. Yeah, yeah. There are places in Durham where your food options are only um, 7-Eleven convenience store, mm -hmm. Slim Jims and Doritos. These food deserts. Food deserts mm -hmm. or McDonald's. Right. And so we're making headway on that. There's mm -hmm. a lot of different approaches and a lot of different um, thinking about it. And But I think that food studies in food justice um, must contain that aspect. So you would, <coughs> this is a different viewpoint than I've heard. I mean, I know you're pulling together different philosophical strands of thinking about animals and about food. Um, but are there others um, thinking in this same way? Or are you ahead of the pack in this thinking? Or are you um, joining others in this push towards a new animal advocacy? Um, I, you know, as usual, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of food... I'm way in the middle. Mm. There's people way out in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, we've got lots of different initiatives here at Duke. And, well, the fact that Jonathan Saffron 4 was the book we read. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm not at the forefront right. of, of the locavore movement. I'm just parroting what's yeah. out there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in terms of animal advocacy more generally, how mm -hmm. I would argue this is mm -hmm. this, that... There are tons of people in the game of talking about animals from more connected philosophies. Um, there's a whole thing, a whole world out there called animal studies. Mostly that is continental philosophy on the question of human exceptionalism. Now, I think I'm at the forefront of bringing all of that into conversation with the world of advocacy. There's very little out there written for the general public that says, hmm, 
you know, animal rights might not have it right. We maybe could, you know, think about animal advocacy in this different register. Mm -hmm. Um, And if so, um, maybe you would want to get on board with this program. Maybe you want to stop eating grocery store meat Mm -hmm. and start buying meat from animals who had a very good life. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe you want to start thinking about where you get your pets from or what you do with your pets. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that I'm taking a philosophical um, platform in animal studies that's already out there and just moving it over to the general public, putting it in conversation with the liberal tradition. Well, we just got a question in that sort of mm-hmm. sort of relates to, to what you just said. Um, this is an email question from Jay, um, who says there are a lot of people who don't care that much about animals um, as much as you do, the same way some people don't care about sports or dancing or other things. Um, those people aren't bad, they're just different. Um, what right do you have to tell them they need to make animals a bigger part of their lives if they want to be morally fit to eat a hamburger. Fair enough. Um, And I actually say in the book that, you know, and I think there are people who really don't like animals. And I'm not sure that this book is for them Mm -hmm. or this platform is for them. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that those people puzzle me a little. Animals, and I don't mean that you have to um, have a pet or or be in, in the room with an animal or... I, th- I think that animals have always helped us form our social imaginary. It's about Disney, and it's about the magic of their lives. Mm-hmm. And you can have a relationship with animals that's only in representation, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I have a good friend who, you know, just watches, her daughter just watches The Lion King over and over and over, right? And that's a relationship. Mm-hmm. This wonderful guy... Um, naturalist named Paul Shepard said, we only know how to be in this world by watching animals. Mm. Um, We watch what other animals eat and know what's poison and what's not poison. We watch what, how other animals interact and that they have, Paul Shepard argues, a kind of purer, a more pure relationship to the world than we do. But we get, can get that purity by watching them. So, you're, this is not a book for everybody. Mm-hmm. We've given up on the idea that one thought can deal with everybody. Mm-hmm. But I think there are an awful lot of people out there who have a soft spot in their hearts for either real animals or ch- ch- children's books and movies. Mm-hmm. And it's there that I'm trying to make an intervention to say, let's use that energy to um, build a better world. Do you think part of our, our interest in animals has to do with the, the, um, the mystery? We don't know what they're thinking. We don't know what they're... But you, you, you have said that you, you know each animal has its own worldview. Yes. Its own way of seeing the world. And who are we to... Can you talk about that? Sure. Who are we to kind of impose our <coughs> own hu- human humanness on them? That's right. So there's this great guy whose um, animal studies is bringing back into the kind of uh, philosophical canon named Jacob von Mm Uxko. And he is a German biologist at the turn of the 20th century. And he called it that he said that animals had their own umwelt. And that he called that, he described that umwelt as a soap bubble. And that the limits of your senses create your world. So he talks a lot about a tick. And a tick only has the sense of smell. Like does, a tick, like a flea and tick, like a tick? Yes, uh-huh. a tick that goes uh-huh. on a dog. Okay. It, we have five senses, uh-huh. right? We have smell, sight, taste, hearing. And a tick only has smell. And it waits on a branch and appears to be dead, doesn't eat, sometimes for three or four years, and um, is kind of dormant. And when it smells, it's a certain kind of acid, butyl. Hyac acid, I think. I have to look that up. Okay. Don't quote me on that. Okay. But it smells it, and that's very prevalent on dogs. And it drops off onto the dog uh-huh. and feeds. On, it doesn't taste it, but it feeds on the blood, drops off. If it drops off naturally, dies and gives 
in, in the death gives birth to a new tick. That's the entire life cycle. Now, von Uxkel takes that and mm-hmm. tries to imagine what the contours of that tick's world are. And there's no way we can imagine only having the scent of smell, only having one action in your whole life. But because we have science and language, we can look inside that soap bubble and see a little bit about what it's like. Well, the same is true for dogs or for chimps. We can't ever really fully know their world, but the boundary between us is somewhat transparent, and we can try. Dogs have senses of smell, regular, not regular, but non-scent hounds have 10,000 times more smell than we do. Scent hounds, like bloodhounds, beagles, have 100,000 times deeper scent. They can smell stuff two miles away and know, like, you know, I can't even smell you, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And so we can't really imagine it, but using metaphor and analogy and imagination, right. we can try. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I think this is a really interesting discussion. We have a comment from a viewer, uh, Linda, who says, Thank you for opening up so many minds. A real positive beginning in a new, very needed direction. Thank you. So I think there are some people who are kind of coming around to your way of thinking. Well, it's not mine. I mean, um, uh, there are a lot of people doing it. The great Buddhist activist, Joanna Macy, calls this um, the great turning. And I think we are all really realizing that um, we're losing our world. And if we can't figure out psychological, emotional, and spiritual mechanisms to connect us better, it's very likely that we're going to lose all these great animals, and we're going to lose our place in the world. We're going to run out of food. We're going to run out of water. Right. And this is one way, um, not the only way, and it's not going to work for people who don't like animals, mm-hmm. but it's one way for us to rethink our place in the universe. Well, one, one quick question, final sure. question I want to ask you is what books um, should people, can you name a couple of books people should be reading if they want to learn more about this or... Educate about, themselves? About what in particular? About animal adv- advocacy, about um, anything, about food, okay. sustainability. Um, I, wow. <laughs> I know, it's a lot. <laughs> That's just, kind of big. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I'll just shoot off a couple of my favorite just books. Just a couple of your favorites. I love the author Raj Patel. In his book, Stuffed and Starved, is all about global food industry. That was his first one. His new one is called The Value of Nothing. Mm. And if I could um, only recommend one book, I think it would be that. It's about a revaluing of our entire world and how we so lost touch in consumer culture. We so lost touch with the, with the things that, um, that bring us. Okay. Well, Kathy, thank you so much. Thank you, Camille. That is it for this episode of Office Hours. Please tune in next week uh, at Thursday at noon for the next episode. Watch Duke. On demand. On demand. Duke.edu. This week in Duke On Demand, two Duke seniors describe their experience analyzing fossils found in a major anthropological dig in South Africa. I was really interested in in bones and their morphology and, and why they're shaped the way they are, how that relates to function. It was a really great experience to see uh, maybe how I could fit into that type of work in the future. Duke language instructor Jacques Pierre introduces his courses on Haitian Creole. And the Go Duke Weekly Web Show features sports commentary, interviews, highlights, and more. ondemand.duke.edu